this is the wrap-up week on this uh, money story series, and uh, I've been excited about the series, and uh, really the goal of the series, the whole three weeks, is that each of our folks, each of our families, would call a time out and think about their story of money. What's my story of money? How does it work? Where does money come from? What is for? Who owns it? Your story of money. Take a pause and say, where did it come from? And how does it line up with the story of God? You know, the stories we tell ourselves have great power on us. One time, a couple years ago, uh, we had a big tree in our front yard, and it was when those straight winds came through, and a big branch crashed across our driveway, uh, crashed across the, the road and the sidewalk. And at that time, we had an old neighbor, Frank Lechtenberg, who was in this church, and he was probably 86, 88 years old. And so I'm out there with my little chainsaw, and here comes Frank with his big chainsaw. And I mean, I was going, Frank, you shouldn't be helping us. You shouldn't own a chainsaw. Frank, you should not even be here. And in one sentence, he told me the story that had power for him. And this is what he said, Dave, this is what neighbors do. When there's a need, they help out. So even at 88 years old, he probably was told that story on a farm when he was growing up as a boy. This is what neighbors do. And so it's still having power on him. You're telling yourself stories every day that's having power on you. You have stories about family. You have this story about how a family works and what a family is and how they get together and how they celebrate holidays. And that story has great power over you. And one of the things that I I really want to hit on today and it's been the purpose of the series is for you to stop and say, what's my story of money? What's my story of money? And how much power does it have over me? And so uh, uh, for my story of money, I'm going to start with my grandpa and grandma. They grew up during the Depression. And uh, my grandpa had a family. My dad told me this week he was about four years old during the beginning of the Depression. And uh, my grandpa told stories about the Depression that had power on him that has power on me and uh, has power on my children and probably will end up having power on my grandchildren. My grandpa stood in line with coupons in order to get food And he would stand in line for a long time, and then uh, uh, there would be uh, be, uh, a limited amount of food that he could get with his coupons. And then he also was unemployed, and they had these places downtown Waterloo where you could stand in line for quite a while, and you would get a job for one day. And so they would go down early in the morning, they would stand in line, and someone would hire them for manual labor for one day. And the lucky ones were the ones who got a job at a very minimum wage for one day. And you might stand in line half a day and not get a job. And then my grandpa had his money in a bank that closed and never reopened. And so those things had great power. For instance, my grandpa, when he died, he never believed in banks again. And so when he died, this was a decade or so ago, um, I remember his grown children going into his house and saying, I wonder where his money is. He didn't believe in banks, but he ended up making quite a bit of money. And so they started looking in the attic. They found money, cash, and U.S. savings bonds in his suit coats, uh, taped under drawers, uh, stuffed in attic insulation. They had to, like, tear the house apart to find his money. Now, you and I, in our story, we're going, that's not as safe as a bank. But my grandpa's story was different. He uh, never wanted to go hungry again. So once he started making some money, he went to the grocery store and he bought cases of corn, cases of green beans, cases of broccoli, and he would stack them up against his basement wall. And once we were going on a vacation with our boat and we were going up to Okoboji, and I remember so clearly, he opened up the hood of his car because he was going to ride with my parents and he brought this case of corn to the boat and he said, here, let's take this. (laughs) And here I am, a little boy, my dad goes, we cannot take cases of corn on vacation. Right? But his story of money had power over him. And what I figured out is it has power over me. It has, a, it has affected some of my attitudes and thoughts about money. My parents. Uh, my mom was 17. My dad was 21, uh, just out of the military. My mom was a waitress. Uh, really never graduated, even from junior high school. And uh, shortly before I was born, they were married. And they were poor. My dad had to drop out of college to support this new family, and 
Uh, one of the stories we tell in my family is my dad would get off of a job at a factory downtown Waterloo, and he'd have a quarter in his pocket, and he'd have to decide, do I take the bus home, or do I buy a loaf of bread for the family? We were poor. I remember, as a, like a six or eight or ten-year-old, my dad teaching my mom how to answer the phone when the bill collectors called. We always kept our bills by the phone. And for those of you who are younger, phones actually hung on the wall, and they were like in one place. A lot of times you had a shelf there. And uh, just saying. Uh, we had a pile of bills by the phone, and I remember my dad instructing my mom, when they call you to keep them off our backs a little bit, uh, offer to pay them a certain amount of the money. Now, we can't pay the full amount we owe, but if you'll promise to send them 15 or $20, then they'll just let it go another month. And so here I am, a little boy watching that, and that affected me. Then my dad started going to church, and he became a follower of Jesus, as did my mom, as did our kids, we were all baptized. And the offering plate went by, and my dad, with a pile of bills that we could never pay, started putting money in the offering plate. And I mean, I'm an eight-year-old boy, and I'm going, no, we shouldn't be putting money in, we should be taking money out. <laughs> and I remember the power it had on me. My dad at that time was a warehouse uh, foreman, big, uh, muscly guy. I remember the impact it had on me when I saw him once fold his hands and close his eyes and pray. It had so much impact. Those of you who are dads, grandpas, be sure your kids see you praying in church. Be sure your kids see you giving sometimes or explain it to them. It has power on them. So all those things have had power on me. Somebody told my dad in his early journey that one thing followers of Christ do is give Christ 10% of their income. It helps them fight greed. It supports his work. It, they just give 10%. They just do it. So my dad, he just said, well, if that's what you do when you're a follower of Christ, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm going to do that. And so what power it had on me when they were giving, and we still had that pile of bills. And then I remember my dad being in an argument one time with some relatives, and he said, Here's what I believe. I believe I'm seeing that the money I keep goes farther than the money if I'd have kept the 10%. I believe the re my 90% goes farther. And I, just stories, right? Stories of God. So then Lynn and I get married our second year of college. And we're poor. And uh, I'm working one place, she's working another. We're in college together and we're getting student loans. Not as big as student loans today, but we're getting student loans. And then uh, we work a year out of college and we save and scrimp and save and scrimp. And then we go into the bank to pay off our student loans way early. And the banker basically says, you're idiots. Uh, don't pay off this loan early. This is the best interest rate you're going to get. He didn't see today's interest rates. Um, <laughs> And pay, don't pay it off. But we did. We had to. That was our story. We're not going to be in debt. And we have young families in this church operating that same way with the same kind of a story. We've always been frugal. The other night, we had a small group at our house and, uh, from the church. And uh, we get, one of the guys couldn't find a coaster for his coffee cup. And he said, Dave, I need a coaster for this coffee cup, don't I? And I looked at the table he was going to set it on. I said, no, you do not need one for that table. That table came out of my grandma's attic 47 years ago. It was the first piece of furniture we ever got. We've never gotten any other table. My grandkids jump and color and do everything on it. No, you do not need a coaster. Now, his story, he still had to find a coaster and put it on there. My wife and I discovered early that you can live in America really well out of other people's attics. I mean, you just go up in their attics and they have great beds and couches and tables and desks and dressers and you can. And when you live in Cedar Falls, you can live quite good off of certain days when you're driving around with your pickup <laughs> and it's the day the college students are like, bring, they got more money than any of us and they're just putting like couches and stuff out on the curb and you're going, there's a good one. <laughs> a 
It's crazy. It's crazy. I figured out I'm really frugal. And it's washed over our church. I've furnished two offices here in the church and lots of our other offices. All donated stuff. Because businesses close. And they call a nonprofit and they go, hey, you got any use for this stuff? In fact, it happened a couple weeks ago. We furnished all of the offices and the lobby out of our new Grundy, Grundy campus building out of Community Bank, downtown Waterloo. They had great stuff. We got it all for free. Now, depending on your story, some people would say you never put used stuff in new buildings. It's not our story. Our story is God has us on a mission, and we got more to do for Christ than we have money, so let's, uh, let's look for how God's going to provide for us. And so see how your story has an effect on the decisions you make and how you live and how important it is? So as second-year college students, Lynn and I decided we needed to give back to God 10% or more of every dollar we made. I listened to Chuck Shirey's uh, sermon when he was here a couple weeks ago. And remember that point oh five? As a kid, his dad told him he got 50 cent allowance and he said he put point oh five into the offering every five of a nickel every week. And so Lynn and I started doing that as college students. And now some of our grandkids are being taught. You know, here's a bucket, here's a little bucket for your giving, here's a little bucket for your savings, here's a little bucket for your spending. So powerful. Another reason, I keep saying this, another reason why your story is so important is because your kids and grandkids are going to end up with your story and being influenced by it. And it's so important that you um, get your story as right as possible. So we started giving and we've given 10% of our income since then or more. Jesus talked a lot about money. He talked more about money than Orchard Hill Church ever will. He talked about money a lot because he knew this. You can't be a follower of Jesus, all-out follower, unless you make Jesus Lord of your checkbook, Lord of your portfolio. You can't do it. You can't withhold a part of your life from him and not do it. So as I sit in my office and people come talk to me, I thought I would just like shine a light on some of what I hear about money that maybe God would want to correct in your story if he could tweak it just a little bit. And so the first thing I hear uh, quite often, uh, it can be in the lobby or the commons or it can be in my office, is that money and worry go together like hand in glove. As soon as you start talking about money, then some of your story says, I got to worry. I got to worry. Um, and uh, money and worry go together. And then sometimes I'll mention, you know, Jesus said, you shouldn't worry about money. And then I hear their story. No, you have to worry about money. Who said? Well, my story says I have to worry about money. No, you don't. Jesus said, what is a profit a man? To worry, does it add one day to his life, one hour, or does it add one hour to his bank account? No. Now, work, plan, be intentional, but don't worry. If you are a worrier about money, stop it. You go, well, how can I do that? My whole life I've been worrying about money. Well, ask God to help you because worry doesn't add a dollar. It doesn't add an hour. It does nothing. Second thing, when people are telling me their story about money, one thing that comes up is scarcity. It's like there's never enough, never enough. It's like I never make enough. I never have enough. I never save enough. I never give enough. There's never enough. I'm always short. Another thing that comes up quite often is the idea that it's my money. If, if the Bible's clear about anything, it's really clear about this. The money in your bank account, it's not yours. It's his. The car you drove over today, it's not yours. It's his. The boat in your garage you're trying to store for winter or the motorcycle, it's fine. Just so you keep in track whose it is. You didn't have it when you were born. You won't take it with you when you die. And in the meantime, you're managing his stuff. And you ought to have a blast managing it. 
This is not like a this is not like a downer sermon. This is like have a blast managing God's stuff, but keeping track of whose it is. It's his. Here's another one. You don't talk about money. If you, I mean, you, politics and money right now. You don't talk about these things, right? You can't. And what did Jesus say? He said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he said, shine a light on things. And so everyone in this room has a story of money and there ought to be somebody you trust that you talk to about it. Somebody you trust that you open your books and you open your checkbook and you open your income and you open your tax forms. There ought to be somebody. Why? Because it keeps you honest with yourself. It shines light on it. And a lot of you were taught this, a lot. It's like, oh, you don't talk about money. In fact, many of you don't even talk in your marriage about money. I got my money, she's got her money. We're not even gonna open our books to each other. The more you shine light on, the more God can bring truth and joy to this money experience. Now, I know every family can't do what our family has grown into doing, but I just want to say we have a blast at the end of every year, first week of January, where like um, we bring our, our graphs and charts to our dining room table, and like we actually talk about our income and our spending, and we actually have fun making fun of each other. You spent that much eating out, you spent that much on your dog. You spent that much. I mean, we actually have fun because, like, there's nothing to hide. And if you can live that way with nothing to hide and no secrets in the area of money. And so some of you need a coach. Some of you need just to be honest in your marriage. Here's, a, here's another thing that comes up. I have no idea where it goes. I have no idea where it goes. Uh, I gave this sermon a week ago or two weeks ago down in the sanctuary, and a mom was up front with her 14-year-old son. And uh, she said, Dave, come here. I want, you to, I want my son to tell you whatever it is, he, uh, our story of money. So she turns to him. She's never told him she's going to do this. Hey, tell Dave what you've learned from us about money. And he looks at her, he smiles, he goes, it comes in and it goes out. <laughs> That's his story. Carter Moore, our college director, uh, does a tremendous job on this. A lot of college students want to talk about money and income and how do you choose a career and how do you pay off loans, and Carter has a rule. If you want to talk to him about money, the first conversation is free, and the second conversation, you have to keep track of where your money goes for 30 days and bring that form before you'll have a second conversation. And when I heard that, I thought, genius! Genius! Most people have never kept track of where their money goes for 30 days. And so to get a college kid to keep track of how much went for coffee, how much did I use on Wednesday night, how much went for gas and books and snacks, what a great thing that is. And so um, figure out where it goes, keep track of it. Monthly payments are trump card, right? It's like... Uh, uh, we went to buy a car. Well, our car was totaled in an accident. Actually, a couple of them were. Um, <laughs> we're not going into that. And we went to buy a car. And all they would talk about is the monthly payment, the monthly payment, the monthly payment. Finally, I said, we don't think in terms of monthly payment. Like, we're going to pay for this. And he goes, oh, you're one of those. You know, you have to look past monthly payment to like, what's this thing actually going to cost? Um, otherwise, you get monthly paymented to death. Uh, the last one I want to hit on is, uh, I don't have enough to give God back 10%. Uh, that might be your story, uh, but it's not true. Uh, Jesus was with his guys one time, and they were at the temple, and uh, at the temple, there was an interesting way to give money. There was a, like an altar table kind of thing where people blew horns. When rich people came with buckets of money and they would like dump the buckets of money on the altar, the trumpet would go da 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 And then they had this little, like just little offering place for poor people. And uh, so there was a rich guy dumping in lots of money and there was a widow putting in like two or five pennies. And Jesus said, hey guys, come here, come here, come here. He's talking to his disciples. He said, hey, look at this. Who's giving the most? 
And I can just, Peter, I can just think of Peter. Well, who's giving the most? Is this a trick question or what? Come on, Jesus. It's absolutely clear who's giving the most. And Jesus said, no. It's the widow giving two pennies. And then he tells why. Because she's giving all she has. And he's giving out of his abundance. Now what I used to think when I read that was that Jesus said her giving means more. He's still giving more, but her giving means more. But no, it's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God works really incredibly weird sometimes. And in this area of money, it works really weird. In that God's value on a gift is not the number of zeros behind the gift like yours and mine. God's value on a gift is how much sacrifice and what percentage was it. That's how he values a gift. So then Jesus can truthfully say, the widow with two cents, she gave more because she gave all she had. He, it has a lot of zeros, but he gave out of his abundance. And that's why I love giving in the church. Because a little widow, 88 years old, on Social Security for 30 years, writes her little check and puts it in her offering plate. And Jesus looks down from heaven and he says, what a gift. What a gift. Oh my goodness, what a gift. And some of the rest of us who are working and making money, lots of money, we give ours and it's good. But she's not, it's not held against her because she's giving a lot out of her, like the widow. Let me read some words of Jesus and see how this might uh, help your story. Uh, Someone in the crowd, we've got this on a slide, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter with you, between you? Then he said to them, first of all, I would like you to understand, most times in the New Testament when people ask Jesus a question, he never answered it. He did not answer their questions. And here the guy's saying, hey, be an arbiter. And Jesus said, no. And then he uses it as a chance to say something he wants to say. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. Oh, this parable, so important. Such a great parable, so important truth. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I'll share my surplus grain. I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God too has said to him, you fool. When God said five or 10 times in the New Testament to a person, you fool. And whenever he does, like, I always want to read that real close because I don't want him to say that to me at heaven's gates, you know, oh, you fool. Uh, This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Okay, now hear this. Some people read the parable and think that Jesus is saying he's a fool because he built bigger barns. That is not what it says. You need bigger barns? Build them. You need a bigger house? Build it. You need a newer car? Buy it. What makes him a fool? That he's not rich towards God. This is not a parable against bigger barns. Nothing wrong with bigger barns. But what does Jesus say? He gives the answer right there. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves. Nothing wrong with storing up things for yourselves, but is not rich towards God. So be sure you're rich towards God. I think when you get to heaven, there's a couple questions at the gate. I think the Bible's really clear about it. Number one is, what did you do with my son, Jesus? Well, I took him as my leader. I took him as my rescuer, my savior, my Lord. I took him. And then Jesus puts his arm around you and says, come on in. 
And while you're walking through the gate with Jesus, he says, by the way, what did you do with the life I gave you? What did you do with the stuff I entrusted to you? How did you use it for my kingdom, my friend? I think we'll all answer that question one day, and especially us. You see, you were born in the richest country in the history of the world. How are you using your stuff? Nothing wrong with bigger barns. Just be sure you're rich towards God. That's what I'm trying to do. One time I was in Haiti. Uh, Actually, it was the first day I was in Haiti ever. I had just ridden the bus, the truck, through the neighborhoods. I'd seen a third world country for the first time. My mouth was open. And the pastor, I said, uh, he said, you're teaching in my church tomorrow. I said, good. What would you like me to teach on? He said, I'd like you to teach on stewardship. I said, I can't teach on stewardship in your church tomorrow. I do not have any idea what it means to be a steward when your kids' stomachs are bloated with hunger. And this uneducated pastor picked up his Bible and he said, Dave, is it true or not? You see, the message I bring is not just a middle-class North America mission. I, had to, I, I hardly slept that night. And I had to answer, is it true that I still need to give back to God some of what he gives me, even if I live in a dirt hut with a dirt floor? just subside, just just barely making it? And the answer is, the principles are true. That's why Jesus picked out the widow and said, everybody can give something back, even parents who live in a mud house. Everybody. I noticed Jeff said in his prayer, I think it was in his prayer where he said, we don't want anybody to go home Uh, feeling guilty or beaten up when we're talking about money. We don't. That wasn't Jesus' style. God is not an arm-twisting God who says, hey, you do what I want or I'll twist your arm off. That's not who God is. It's more of an invitation. And my invitation this morning is think about the words of Jesus and think how you might find more joy by lining up your story of money closer to his. More joy. I'll pray. God, thank you for uh, the truth of your word, for the parables of Jesus, for the opportunity to come and worship. Father, thank you that we've had parents and grandparents and a history and spouses who've helped us develop our own story of money. Thank you for the places where our story of money lines up with the words of Jesus. And Father, give us courage courage to uh, correct and tweak our story of money as it uh, is not lined up with the words of Jesus. Um, Father, uh, uh, you are a good, good, good Father. And we love you. And those of us who maybe can't even say we love you, we're still trying to understand who you are and who your son is. So, Father, um, help us take next steps, uh, please. In Jesus' name, amen.